Please stand. The text for our sermon this morning is our epistle reading from Hebrews chapter 12. Listen again to these words from that reading. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you have been redeemed. It's a word you're familiar with. You've heard that word before, redeemed. Maybe you even remember from confirmation class or from another sermon. To be redeemed means to be bought back. But did you know that the word redeemed is associated with the slave trade? That to redeem a slave would be to pay full price for that person and then set him free. Set her free. That's redeemed. You have been redeemed. You have been bought at full price with the blood of Jesus Christ and set free. Many of you know that I grew up in central Indiana. And if you've ever been through central Indiana, you know it's a very flat area. Cornfields, not a lot of, not a lot of hills. In fact, when we moved up to this area, I felt like we were, we were moving into a really hilly area compared to what I grew up with. And I think because of that, growing up, I always wanted to see snow-capped mountains. Of course, I'd seen them in movies and in television shows, and I had pictures in my mind from books that I'd read and adventures that had taken place in the mountains, and I wanted to see them for myself. I had this image of how awe-inspiring, how majestic those peaks would be if I could just see them with my own eyes. But because of where we live, where our extended family lived, where we went when we, when we had vacation time, I didn't have the opportunity and so my oldest brother moved away from home and he moved to Seattle. And we went to go visit him for the first time over Christmas break. And so our plane was coming down into Seattle and I knew that the Cascade Mountains were just off to the east. And if, and if we would come in at the right angle, I'd be able to see them out the window. And so I was glued to the window of this airplane, waiting for my first glimpse of snow-capped mountains. But if you know anything about Seattle or the Pacific Northwest, especially in the winter, it's almost always covered with clouds. And sure enough, as we came into the airport, I didn't see the mountains. In fact, I barely even saw the runway before we got to it. We went from there to my brother's house. And right away, of course, he gives us the tour of where he lives. And he tells us that from this certain spot on the steps, looking out this particular window between those two trees, on a clear day, you'll see Mount Rainier lowing in the distance. On a clear day. The whole week we were there, we never had that clear day. The mountain was there, it was real, but we couldn't see it. All I could see was the fog, the clouds, the vapors. The words from the writer to the Hebrews say that you have come to Mount Zion. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched that's burning with fire. He's talking about Mount Sinai there. The mountain where, where God gave the law to the Israelites and gave it to Moses and the people were terrified terrified because they were told that if even an animal touched that holy mountain, it had to be stoned to death. That mountain was holy. It was the place of God's presence. And they lived in fear of it. But the author of the book of Hebrews says, you have not come to, to a mountain that can be touched that's burning with fire. No, you have come to Mount Zion. You've come to the city of the living God. You've come to the heavenly Jerusalem. The church of the firstborn, thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, you have come to God. And here you are, gathered together in worship. And the author of the book of Hebrews is telling you that when you look around and you see these people who are worshiping with you, you have not seen all of those who are gathered together in worship of our great and our mighty God but that you have come to God's presence. Not the fearful presence of Mount Sinai, but the glorious holy presence of Mount Zion. And so you are gathered in worship, not just with those who you see with your eyes, but also with what we call the communion of saints, with that community of believers from all times and of all places. You are gathered together with thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, and you are here in the very presence of God himself. You are at Mount Zion. Can you see it? Or is there something clouding your view? Is there something coming between you and the presence of God? 
making it difficult for you to see the mountain. Maybe it's the fog. The fog emanating from that sinner sitting two pews over from you. You've heard the way he talks when he's not in church. How holy can this place be if he's here every week? Or maybe it's the fog emanating from that sinner standing in front of you. A preacher should be held to a higher standard. This one can't even meet his own standards, much less God's. If you haven't realized it yet, you will. When it's your prayer request, I forget. When it's your name, I mispronounce. When it's your feelings, I hurt and I'm apologizing for it. Maybe that's where the fog is coming from. Or maybe the fog is emanating from that sinner sitting in your seat. The one you know best. The one whose every failure and every weakness you are most familiar with. The one whose sins you've watched take place. Maybe that's where the fog is starting from. We're in the presence of God. But all too often we can't see it. All we see is the fog, the vapors, the clouds. So you've been redeemed. You've been bought with the blood of Jesus. And you've been bought with the blood of Jesus for the world of that mountain. It's that blood that brings you into the presence of God without fear. But when all we see is the fog, it's easy to begin to wonder if that mountain is even really there, isn't it? We see Christians wearing the same clothes as non-Christians, driving the same cars, working the same jobs, going to the same entertainment, chasing the same dreams, facing the same temptations, and all too often falling into the same sins. To be holy means to be set apart, to be made different. You were purchased to be made holy. But in this fog, everything looks the same, doesn't it? So how can we know that we've been redeemed? How can we know that the mountain is really there? How can we know when we can't see it? Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And I say, yes, Lord, but how can I know when all I see is fog? If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Yes, Lord, I believe that. But I don't feel free. I feel like I'm still a slave. Sometimes I feel like a slave to my family. Sometimes I feel like a slave to my boss. Sometimes, Lord, I feel like I'm a slave to you. How can I know that I'm free when I still feel these shackles on my wrists and on my feet? And God says, you can know that you're free because you know that I paid for you. I do eventually get to see those snow-capped mountains. The whole week we were there in Seattle, the fog never lifted. But on one day, we drove right through it, and we ended up driving right out of it. We went to go see Snoqualmie Falls, which are these 270-foot waterfalls that originate in the mountain springs. And so we're driving through this fog and this vapor and these clouds, and then all of a sudden, the clouds sort of part, and there they are, staring at me out the windshield, the Cascade Mountains. I can honestly say I was awestruck. We pulled off the road just so we could look at them. Now, we did go on to the falls, and they were amazing, but to me, they didn't compare with the sight of the mountains themselves. There's something about that majesty, about that glory of a mountain poking up into the sky, jutting up there with all of its rugged beauty, painted with snow. It's hard for me to imagine anything more awe-inspiring than that sight, except for the one who made those mountains, the one who crafted them in their ruggedness, who painted them with that snow and who set them against the blue sky. It's hard for me to imagine anything more awe-inspiring than those mountains except for God himself stretching out his hand to be crucified. That's awe-inspiring. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. As Peter says, it wasn't with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were bought back, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you. No, it was with the precious blood of Christ that you were purchased. That's the price that God paid for you. Can you see that mountain yet? That sinner sitting two seats over from you? God knew about every careless word he would say and all the thoughts he would never share with you. God paid that price anyway. The sinner standing in front of you, 
God knew every single one of my weaknesses every time I would fail. And He paid the price anyway. The soul sitting in your seat right now, God knew the attitudes of your heart. God knew the failures in your attempts to serve Him. God knew the times you would ignore Him. He paid the price anyway for you. Can't you see that mountain yet? The World War II movie, Saving Private Ryan, is one of my favorite movies. And you can see in that movie, you can see the story told of, of eight men who are sent into dangerous zones and sometimes even behind enemy lines in order to bring back Private James Ryan. Now James Ryan has to come home because he's the last of his brothers left alive through the war. And so Central Command has determined that he needs to be brought back from the front lines. And so they send these eight men to go get him. And along the way, the men begin to lose their lives. One is killed by a sniper. Others die as they try to take a, a machine gun hill. In the end, five of the eight have already died. And as the captain is taking his last breath, he looks up at Private James Ryan and he says, Earn it. Earn this earn this. His life had been purchased. The price was breathtaking. The lives of six men, some of them officers, for one lowly private. And so earn it. Earn this. Your life has been purchased. The price was breathtaking. The Son of God for a lowly sinner like me. But God doesn't say earn it. He just says, that's how much I love you. Can you see that mountain yet? We live in a world with fogs and vapors emanating all around of us. Emanating from us, emanating from the people around us, emanating from, from the concerns and the cares of this world, and sometimes even from the pleasures when we separate the pleasures from the God who gives them. And we may find ourselves shrouded in that fog so that the, the mountain of holiness, so that the presence of God seems unreachable, untouchable. But it's there. And you can know what's there because even when you can't see that mountain, you can see the mountain of sacrifice. You can read the historical accounts of the crucifixion. You can hear it in the voice of Jesus as he cries out from the cross, Tetelestai. It is finished. It's the Greek way of saying, paid in full. You have been redeemed, purchased, not with perishable things like gold or silver, with the precious blood of Christ Jesus. And so even though you may find yourself shrouded by the fogs and the vapors of this world, there will come a day when the sun will come and the vapors will be parted and you'll see it. Majestic in glory. Beautiful in holiness. You'll touch it. You'll feel it. Can you see the mountain yet? You've been bought with the blood of Jesus. And so you will. You belong to the world of the mountain. Amen.